right, good morning, church. Um, Philip, I'm going to read our uh, teaching text for today. We have, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find the rest of your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11. Just pray with me real quick. Church, I'm just going to keep this prayer simple today, and all I say is, come Holy Spirit. Fill this room, Lord, and just fill our hearts with yourself, Lord, and just be with us throughout this teaching today. Amen. Yeah, give it up for Philip. Every time that you pick up your phone, a magazine, or drive down I-25, you will see all sorts of advertisements. Family having dinner, an attractive person reading a book in a hammock, a group of friends and families playing games, etc. What is it that they are advertising? What are they selling? Well, first, they are seeing a desire that we have and capturing that desire with saying we can satisfy that. Our human nature is never fully satisfied, right? We never feel complete or have fullness in our life. We say things to ourselves like, one more slice, one more toy, trinket, one more customer, one more day off, one more TikTok for some in the room. That's me. One more. Yet, even when we get what we want, we still don't feel fully satisfied. We often have buyer's remorse, guilt, and shame, or even embarrassment for what we find ourselves doing in desperation to be satisfied. What could truly satisfy us? Is that cheeseburger? Is it the relationship? Is it something more serious like a job where you're like, if I just had this job, if I could just make this money, then I would be satisfied. St. Thomas Aquinas, a great 13th century priest, studied and wrote of what it would take for our desires to be satisfied. He came to this conclusion. It would take experiencing everything and being experienced by everything for us to be fully satisfied. We are finite beings with an infinite desire. So our world offers so much to us for us to go and take what we want. Our society says work for your desires and achieve success. Hustle, 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 and you will be somebody. While Jesus offers us something else. Jesus offers rest. To place our desires on him, not to eliminate them, but to put our desires in the right order. St. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until it finds its rest in thee. Our culture is fighting for our constant attention with these advertisements and what they are selling, and it ends up making us spend more, take more, ask for more, only leaving us more restless than before. We were already restless with work, family issues, and now we feel restless on all that we're missing out on as well. We say to ourselves, I just need a break, yet we keep going. We pick up our phones, we overwork, we binge watch a new show, and sooner than expected, it's Monday. And we are more tired than before. As John Mark Comer would put it, our society is designed on purpose to make money off of our restlessness. So again, I ask, what are these advertisements selling? What are they convincing us of when we hand over our credit cards? They are selling Sabbath. They are selling satisfaction and rest. Do you feel satisfied? Or do you feel at rest? We're beginning a new series on Sabbath in partnership with Practicing the Way. And can I just say, I'm so excited for this series. I remember the first time Andrew brought it up in 2019. And I was like, dude, let's do it next week. And he was like, "Uh, yeah, maybe. (laughs) And we're finally here. I'm so, so so excited. Um, But this sermon and others in this series has been deeply shaped and helped. Uh, by practicing the way. And so over the next four weeks, as a church, we will be leaning, leaning into the practice of Sabbath. The word Sabbath is Shabbat in Hebrew. 
if you want to try saying that, you can say Shabbat. That's one of the easier Hebrew words. Uh, <coughs> it literally means to stop or cease or be done. Back on page one of the scriptures, there is the unfolding of crea creation. And on day seven, there is Sabbath. Seven in the Hebrew Bible is connected to the idea of fullness and completeness. We all want fullness and completeness. So, so our society is showing you the life you want by saying, you won't have fullness and completeness until you have this. Think about it. You know you've seen the, uh, the advertisements. They want you to want what they have and buy it from them. Have you noticed the commercials? They're trying to sell you ease. If you buy this item, you'll never have to do that annoying task again because this item does it for you. Start watching the ads. Pay attention. They're trying to convince you of something. I watched one uh, just two days ago. It was a Walmart ad, and she forgets to go to the store on the way home, so she orders Walmart delivery or whatever it's called. And then uh, their whole family gets together for dinner. They clink their wine glasses, and everyone's so happy. And I was like, man, I did not realize I was so foolish for not ordering Walmart boxes to my front door. I was like, man, I really have been missing out on this completeness, on this satisfaction, on this ease. We all want a life of stopping, resting, and delighting, and truly living. So how do we get it? Well, first things first, you can't buy the life that you long for. We have all tried at some point or another because I have bought a lot of video games, movie tickets, happy meals, and yet it was a lie. I was never complete, nor experiencing fullness, or even happy after eating McDonald's. So if we can't buy the Sabbath, how do we get it? By stopping. We stop. Walter Ruegermann said, we need a system of rest that contradicts the system of anxiety. As finite beings with infinite desire, it is nothing new to want a life of peace with God in our world and to be living with sincere, true joy. We all ache as primal human beings for Sabbath. This is the gospel that I share with you today. This is the good news. You can find this rest and have this rest, this satisfaction, not only for your body, but for your soul. Let's take a look at the time of Jesus in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew 11. We just read it. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen to the great late uh, pastor Eugene Peterson's paraphrase on Matthew 11. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. We find ourselves tired and constantly lurk working with no real rest, no break from the stress of heartache, busyness, or hurry. By show of hands, tell me if you've heard this before. I'm tired, but doing good. <laughs> you look tired. <laughs> Low-grade exhaustion is the new normal. Why are we so tired? Are we more tired now than ever? Part of the reason for this is body-based. Up until very recently in human history, the most people slept 10 to 11 hours at night. Now the average in Western nations is just over six. Cue all the latest research and neuroscientists on the devastating effect of insufficient sleep on our mind and body. And while there are seasons of life when that's unavoidable, it becomes chronic for far too many of us. We are, dim we are diminished in our whole person because we are so tired. But it's not just our bodies that are tired, it's in Jesus' language, our souls. Even when we go on vacation and catch up on sleep, there's a psycho-spiritual exhaustion that does not go away in the modern world. As a result of the hurry, busyness, a frenetic pace 
of modern life, the noise pollution of city life, the always on work culture, the rising cost of living, more and more people working, multiple jobs to stay afloat, the polarization of politics, radical individualism, and with it the epidemic of loneliness, what some call the greatest health crisis of our time, the digital age, the phone that never stops buzzing, the constant stream of alerts, the churn of a 24-7 news cycle full of outrage and fear. On cell phones, Bo Burnham said this, the choice all of us have at the end of the day is all of the history of the world or the back of our eyelids. That's a crazy, crazy binary to be choosing the entire time. We are hyper-connected and we're lonely. We're overstimulated and we're numb. We're objectifying ourselves and yet we're expressing ourselves. Spiritually, these things are interacting with our souls at a deep level. People are not living in moments. They are planning moments to look back on. They're coming for every second of your life. Again, I'm going to say that. They're coming for every second of your life. It's because these companies like Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram and everything, they went public and they went to shareholders. So they have to grow. Their entire models are based off of growth. They cannot stay stagnant. It has to get more of you. We used to colonize land. That was a thing you could expand into, and that's where money was to be made. We colonized the entire earth. There was no other place for the business and capitalism to expand to. And then they realized human attention. They are now trying to colonize every minute of your life. Every, every single free moment you have is a moment you could be looking at your phone and they could be gathering information to target ads at you. That is what's happening. And I have a feeling we all know this to a degree. We like joke about it. Dude, I'm dead inside. I feel like I've been hit by a truck. I need to catch up on sleep. Like Bo Burnham said, it's not a physical problem of losing, it's not just a physical problem of losing sleep, it's a spiritual problem as well. It's coming for our souls. Now as followers of Jesus, you might be thinking, what's so wrong with being tired? I like to think of myself as an entrepreneur, and right now, I need to prove my work and my capabilities. Right now, you might be saying, I can't rest right now. I need to keep going. Okay, so here's the problem. When you are tired, how well do you truly love people? We follow Jesus who said, the greatest commandment in all of scripture is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, mind, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. For Jesus, love is the goal and the end. It is the metric by, what we, by which we chart our progress. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, but now faith, hope, love remain, these three, but the greatest of these is love. But when we are tired and exhausted, that's the hardest time to love someone, the most difficult time to forgive. Might it even be possible to love our enemy when we're exhausted? Some may say, I am so tired working for God, and you want to come over here and get on my nerves. Can't you see how successful I am? Jesus says this in Mark 4, 19. Underline uh, this verse in your Bible. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, and it's unfruitful. Let's be honest. It is difficult to love God and obey him when we are always exhausted. Who would be attracted to that lifestyle anyway? I see a non-Christian come over and say, you're always tired, you're short with the people around you, you're working life slaves, and you say that your God wants you to surrender everything, and you want me to believe you're truly happy. John Tyson, pastor in New York City, Andrew's fave, had created this metaphor. Imagine your life as an energy power bar. Like on your phone, 100% is what Jesus called life to the full. 0% is dead. We usually don't rest until we're dangerously tired down to 20 or 30 percent. And when we do rest, it's often not long enough to get all the way back to full, but just to keep going. But what do we miss out on in that last 30 percent? What the New Testament calls the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and more. The best stuff all comes when we're rested. 
wisdom, insight, hope, vision for the future, grace for other people's shortcomings, for our own shortcomings, energy to do our best work, etc. If love for God and obedience to God are two sides of the same coin, as Jesus seemed to teach, it's hard to love God when you're worn down. Also, when I'm tired, I am more likely to not love correctly, but I am more likely to sin. Scientists tell us that a lack of rest erodes energy from the prefrontal cortex as a part of the brain that exercises impulse control. We become less engaged with our family and the Lord as a general rule. Tired people are not loving. We all know that person who, when they get hangry, watch out, right? When I'm hangry, just talk Star Wars, get out of my way, and I'll be good, right? I have found in my own life at times I'm rushing, exhausted, and hungry. I am not who I want to be. That is not the life that I want to live, and I don't want I'm tired to be an excuse. This is not how it's meant to be. Jesus and exhaustion. Jesus' will for your life is not for you to be chronically exhausted, sleep-deprived, unhappy, and living with no margin. That's the enemy's will for your life, not Jesus. It is the enemy who is anti-Sabbath. Some of us, in the language of Pete Cesarzo, use God to run from God, saying things like, yes, I am tired, and yes, I have been ignoring my family's needs and wants. It's because I tr- I just really need to be doing ministry right now. No, right now you don't need to do that. God can handle the work. You are not God. You need to stop. It's not your ministry. It's not my ministry. It is the Lord's ministry that he invites us into. John Mark Comer again. I remember the cliche when I was a kid that was used to justify a Sabbathless church life. It was, the devil never takes a day off. True. But last time I checked, we're not following the devil, we're following Jesus. And in the end, the devil dies. This is why rest is essential to apprenticeship to Jesus. Because in the end, if the end goal is to become a person of love in God, we can't do that if we're chronically exhausted. So, is there a practice from the way of Jesus to reorient our lives from exhaustion and toward life to the full? Yes, it's the practice of Sabbath. The seventh day of the week, the day that represents completeness and fullness. From page one of the scriptures, the six days of creation are completed with day seven. I began the practice of Sabbath four years ago, and in that time, I have failed, learned, and practiced and grown from it. I am no longer afraid to say yes to Jesus because Jesus helps me say no to the world. One day a week, I stop. I breathe in what God has for me and breathe out my anxieties. My need to perform and please comes to a halt. The word Sabbath or Shabbat in Hebrew most literally means to stop, but it can also mean to rest, to delight, and even to worship. Based on that, you can frame the Sabbath in four movements, okay? Stop, rest, delight, worship. The plan is to cover each of these movements in the next four weeks. All we cover today is stop. If you have your Bible with you, open to Genesis 2 and read with me or turn to your phones, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from the work of creating that he had done. Notice that God Sabbathed. Let us stop and sit with this very familiar passage that most of us have probably read or heard since we were children. Read it like you've never read it before. God Sabbathed. Yeah, but I'm type A, high-capacity person, God Sabbathed. Yeah, but I'm a doer and I have a lot going on in my life right now, God Sabbathed. Yeah, but I have, a lot, I have little kids at home, I'm starting a business, God Sabbathed. God the Creator Sabbath. And in doing so, he built a rhythm into the fabric of creation. Not to mention Jesus' Sabbath. When the Pharisees were upset with him for breaking the Sabbath, he wasn't breaking it, he was living it well. 
He understood the point. The Sabbath was a day of God's kingdom to come down, for people to be healed, restored, and set free from bondage of this world and the bondage of sin. So Jesus' Sabbath, by going against the rulers of the land and seeing that God was the true ruler of the land, the Pharisees missed that. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath, but rather inviting the kingdom of heaven to come down on the Sabbath. And in Genesis 1 and 2, when God's Sabbath, his presence was there. So it wasn't to point to anything. Rather, at that time, it was the natural move of the Spirit. Right now, the Sabbath is for the broken, the poor, the needy, the destitute, the forgotten, the lonely, the stranger, etc. And you can see that in Exodus 23, Deuteronomy 5. Matthew 5 might be coming to your mind as well. Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's not some distant future. That's right now. Rabbis to this day teach the importance of Sabbath, that if every single Jew practices Sabbath correctly, they believe that it will bring the Messiah's rule. So if Sabbath is a reminder of God's coming rule and reign, and God's rule and reign is restoration, healing, blessing, and more. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he was pointing to what the kingdom of God is like and how it can be accessed now. The Pharisees made it about rules and exclusion of the poor. They continued their Sabbaths following the rule of Rome and their own indulgence. Jesus, God, Sabbath. We work for six days, then we Sabbath. We stop for one. We stop trying to be someone. We stop buying and selling. We stop working or producing. We stop fighting with those around us. We stop. John Mark Comer again. It comes as no surprise that every single society in the history of world civilization has been built around a seven-day week. Even though the week is the one unit of time that's not tied to the movement of the stars, the day is tied to the Earth's 24-hour rotation, the month to the moon's lunar cycle, and the year to the Earth's journey around the sun. The seven-day week is not. It's built around God's own life rhythm. The last, time, the, the last time a serious attempt to change the seven-day week was made in 1793 in the French Revolution, where they attempted a 10-day week of productivity. The result? Productivity plummeted. And worse, there are a rash of suicides and spread of mental illness. Our generation is reliving the French Revolution all over again, not due to a government flat to elongate the week, but to a kind of vast conspiracy of modern life that is throwing us out of any kind of rhythm at all. The smartphone, electricity, the alarm clock, the car, and more have created a world where we go, we go, we go, we go, and we never stop. But God created the human body and the planet itself to live in a rhythm. There is rhythm between day and night, waking and sleeping. There's rhythm of the four seasons, the tides on the beach, the music and the wind. Within our own bodies, there's a rhythm, there's a rhythm of the breath as we inhale and as we exhale. When we lose this sense of rhythm, church, of pace and back and forth, we lose a part of our humanity. When we live without Sabbath, we go against the rhythm that God, the creator himself, built into our body and into the fabric of all creation. When we don't practice Sabbath, we find ourselves never doing enough. We don't feel like we are enough. We can't catch up. We start comparing ourselves to others. We hurt those around us. We get distant and too clingy in our restlessness. We are afraid we can't keep our future together because our shoulders can't carry the weight of the world. We are afraid of how we can take care of other people when we can barely take care of ourselves. We see the illusion of control fading, and in this anxious time, we run from God trying to grab the reins and suck it up. We hear phrases like, grow up, you signed up for this, be a man. And the pressure builds and builds and builds and builds. Marva J. Don says, our false need to be productive, even in the church, builds stress, especially when we find ourselves unable to meet our exorbitant expectations. My therapist shared this with me a couple years ago. He said, it's not usually big traumatic things in our life that cause mental breakdowns. It's usually all of the little things piled up that cause the crash and burn. But when we practice Sabbath, when we enter into the rest of God, we reap the reward. A medical study was done on a large community of Christians, and if you want the source, I can give it to you after service. 
they practice the Sabbath. Uh, they, the study found that not only are they much happier on average than the general population, but they live 11 years longer than other Americans. One doctor pointed out that if you add up the time devoted to Sabbath over a life, it's right around 11 years. He theorized that for every day you Sabbath, you literally add a day to your life. Now, I know my theologians in the room are like, no, we're not under the law of Moses, and so we don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. Well, there are a few debates on that. We can talk in more detail after service if you want to go into the weeds, but the basic truth is this. Wisdom from God never stops being wise, so why do we fight it? God gave Israel great wisdom on stopping, resting, delighting, and worship. We should listen to it. So even though we are no longer under the law, that does not mean that Sabbath is not for us. There are lots of kinds of things in Scripture that we don't have to participate in, but are wise to examine and follow and learn from to become people of love and followers of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, for too many years, the American church has been influenced by our society to be nonstop workers and proud of it. We don't want to be legalistic with this, but we do want to take it seriously. Look at Exodus 19. Exodus 19 is home to the Ten Commandments. If you read the fourth commandment in verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall, do not, shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is within them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Sabbath is a part of the very rhythm of creation. It is how we follow God's example from the garden, and it points us to the return of the garden coming one day. Not only that, the Sabbath is just a good idea. It's, it's not just a good idea. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Comer again says, in fact, Sabbath is the longest of all Ten Commandments. If you were to make a pie chart, it's around 30%. In God's economy, it's just as more important than not trying to lie, steal, or killing. And it's the only commandment we brag about breaking. Even in the moral decay of the West, few people brag about how many lies they told that week or how many affairs they had. Yet many of us brag about how many days in a row we worked, how many emails we did over the weekend, etc. Busyness is a sign of social status in our, in our state, in our country, of how high the ladder you can climb. But this is not the way of God. Wayne Mueller put it, the Sabbath is not a burdensome requirement for some law-giving deity. You ought, you better, you must. But rather, a remembrance of a law that is firmly embedded in the fabric of nature. It is a reminder of how things really are, the rhythmic dance to which we unavoidably belong to. It's also just common sense. And I'm sensing a little bit of hesitation again in the room. What about the early church uh, Christians? In Romans 14, you can, like, you can read it. There's a part where they're like, this guy's eating bacon. This guy's eating food on the Sabbath that was sacrificed to God. This guy's practicing Sabbath on Sunday instead of Saturday, all this stuff. Notice that they're not arguing about practicing Sabbath, but rather how to practice Sabbath. We can't keep running on fumes and remain healthy following Jesus. And Jesus formally said in Mark 2, Jesus said to him, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is our rest. When we partake in the Sabbath, it is similar to partaking in communion. We remember him when we eat the bread and drink the wine. During Sabbath, we rest remembering that he is our rest. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the resting God who desires us to be rested. Comer again. Comer's my favorite, in case you haven't noticed. Jesus, he was speaking to a generation that had the opposite problem to ours. They had hundreds of rules around the Sabbath, for that warped God's intent behind the day. First century Jews needed to hear the second half of the line, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. But most 21st century Christians need to hear the first part, the Sabbath was made for people. Our problem isn't that we have too many rules for the Sabbath, it's that we don't have any. Long before the Sabbath is a command in Scripture, it's a gift from the Creator to you and me and all of creation. 
from a generous, joyful, loving God that Jesus called the Lord of the Sabbath. Hence the command, remember the Sabbath. What is it we remember on the Sabbath? We remember there is a creator God. We live in his world, and it's good. We remember that there's a rhythm to creation. We remember that we don't stop when we're finished because we're never finished. It's never enough. We never stop. We stop when the rhythm of God built into our body says stop. Remember uh, Mr. Incredible. I just cleaned up this place. Can it stay clean for five minutes? Right? We, do, we, we can't stop when we're finished. We won't be finished. We stop when our bodies tell us to. We remember we're not what we do and what, or what we have done or what other people think of us. We are who we are deeply loved by. I believe there's someone in the room who does not know who they are apart from their work. God's message to you today, to you right now, is that you are loved not because of what you are doing. We remember that our life with God is not a right, but a gift. This is a pipe dream, right? Like we have this desire to get ahead, but it never ends, so we will spend our lives striving to, to reach rest when the work is done, but it never will be. The invitation is to rest even though there are still things to do. We don't believe because we are super spiritual or following Jesus that we are then allowed to rest. But rather, it's a gift from God no matter what stage of life we are in. It's a gift that we can receive with open arms, a promise from Jesus, I will give you rest. We get to have that and keep it. If you have related to overstressed and busy, busy, hurried lifestyle right now, here is your reminder of what Jesus said and what he meant. This is for you. You don't have to be this ideal person or have a certain amount of money or the right connections to experience the rest of Christ. It is a time set apart to remember who we are to Jesus and how he cares for us. We remember that the world is full of evil and injustice, yes, but it's also full of goodness, beauty, and truth. We remember that we owe it to God to be grateful and full of joy in this world. We remember that the world doesn't run off of us. We are not God. We can say no or not yet to others, the world will not end if we stop. We can be blessed by knowing that we don't have to bear the world's problems 24-7. We remember his kingdom come, his will be done. We remember who truly is in charge of this whole thing. Again, Marva Dawn. One of the best ways to cease from anxieties and worries is to recognize our true station in life. Not only do we want to develop Sabbath practices of thanking God, but also we are helped enormously if we stop trying to be God. The practice of Sabbath is a day of rest by which we cultivate the spirit of restfulness in our lives, a practice by which we undergo a dramatic shift from rest, restlessness to restfulness. From hurry to peace, Dan B. Allender said, Sabbath is a joyful union at one, connected and in, at and with peace, from busyness to margin. Marva J. Don, a major blessing of Sabbath keeping is that it forces us to rely on God for our future. We can let God be God in our lives. From burnout to sustainable pace, from noise to quiet, from distraction to clarity, isolation, solitude, crowds to community, grasping to gratitude. Do you see it? Do you desire to taste its sweetness? Danby Allender says this, the Sabbath is a day not merely to relax and rest, but to get cozy. Sabbath isn't just so we can learn how to stop either. It realigns us to the heart of God and what he has for us, not just on Sabbath, but all week long. Walter Brueggemann says, people who Sabbath live all seven days differently. It takes place at the end of the week for a reason. It's the climax. It's what we look forward to. And when we Sabbath, it reminds us of what is still yet to come. You do not have to live a Sabbathless life of nonstop exhaustion. You, right where you are, no matter what your stage in life is, you can adopt the practice of Sabbath. All we have to do, church, is stop. So as a community, let us learn and practice stopping together. Here are some helpful tips uh, that practicing the way offered. Uh, make time. 
right after service, get together as a family and friends, and set a time. I understand that we all have different life stages right now, but start somewhere where you can. Maybe, if, maybe it looks for you like just starting a morning of Sabbath and <clears throat> before it becomes a complete 24 hours. Just remember, Sabbath is a rhythm. It is not disorganized and chaotic. Same time, same day of the week to set yourself in the rhythm of creation. Start with a day this week. I personally practice uh, Sabbath from the traditional time, sundown Friday night to sundown Friday night, uh, Saturday night. Sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. My fav- uh, so another thing you can do is prepare for it. My favorite thing about Christmas is that I know when I get to my parents' house, food is ready. You smell the sweet and the savory. Candles are lit, and everyone is on their best behavior. This should be like our Sabbath. I love to light a candle every Sabbath. I start with sitting in my prayer chair. It's just my recliner. It's comfy. I sit in my chair. I light my Sabbath candles. I say the Sabbath prayer. I invite the Holy Spirit into my day. I sit silent for about 10 minutes, and I feast on the food I have prepared, and it's great. It's Christmas every week. I love it. Another thing you can do is turn off your phone. Our cell phones control so much of our lives. We forget to look outside and go for walks. We should rather, we would rather much intake, or we would rather take so much information in from our phones. I lost my place, I'm sorry. We would much rather intake as much information as we can and sit on the couch. Now, it's not a sin to be on your phone during the Sabbath, but be aware of it. It won't hurt you to put it down for 24 hours and tell family and friends, I'm resting. This is a time to rest your mind. It will be good for you. And that's a struggle for me as well. Shut the world out. Don't just rest your body. Rest your mind. Rest your soul. How do we feel? Are you tired and burnt out? Do you hear the queen of the Sabbath invite you to worship the king of the universe? Next week, we're going to talk about the delight of Sabbath. It's going to be great. There is so much more to say about this day of the Lord. But for now, let us anticipate the rest God has for us and wants for us. Will you stand? I'm going to read the words of Jesus again. This is his call to you. This is his promise to you. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.